I'm gonna build a houseboat on the bio. It's gonna be a mighty, mighty pretty sight to see. I'm gonna make it nice and painted red with a little kitchen and a double bed. I'm gonna build a houseboat. It's gonna be a love boat. I'm gonna build a houseboat for you and me. Welcome to a new season of the Boats Log. My name's Tim and I'm the owner of the Royal Tudor, a classic wooden X high boat on the Norfolk Broads. Broad Tudor is 31 feet long and 10 feet in the beam. Constructed from mahogany on oak, she's a centre cockpit, five berth cruiser, built by Ennis Royal in 1960 for his Norfolk Broads hire fleet. I've been passionate about the Norfolk Broads and boats for well over 40 years. On a Broads boating holiday in 1972, my then six year old me decided, when I grow up, I will have a boat. A bloody big wooden one. Well now I've got one and I'm restoring it. But there's a couple of three problems. First and foremost, I've had a few strokes. About 18 of various sizes. Now I'm, I'm left handed and there were left sided strokes and it causes a few problems. So if anyone is watching this video, I do know I sound funny. I have just found out I'm northern and I do know I'm cack handed. Secondly, I know bugger all about boats, and even less about woodwork. Out of necessity, I'm learning about both as I go along, and I made a discovery. I just love working with wood. So as I'm learning, I'm applying my new skills on projects both at home and on the boat, and sharing what I've learned. Fortunately, I have the support of my family and friends. Most importantly, I have the help and support of my particularly good friend, Doug, who does know more than a thing or two about wooden boats. Thank God for that. So if you are as passionate about the Norfolk Broads and wooden boats as I am, or want to see what owning a boat is all about, or simply want to see if the daft pillock nails his hand to the deck, Please like and subscribe to my channel, visit my website at therollchudor.co.uk or pop in for a chat at the norfolkbrosnetwork.com. Details are below in the description. In this episode, I'll be starting work on building a new cockpit for Royal Tudor. 2016 was a mixture of joy and sadness. High winds at the start of the year saw some severe damage done to Royal Tudor. So the decision was taken to lift her, take her to a new boatyard, and begin a thorough and comprehensive restoration of the old girl. We were all excited at the prospect of seeing Royal Tudor back on the water where she belonged, especially my dad Gordon, better known as Uncle Albert on the Broads. Unfortunately, my first trip to start work on the restoration was cut short as dad had fallen ill. So I loaded Royal Tudor's badly damaged cockpit sides and canopy into the car and brought them home to work on in my spare time. Sadly, Dad passed away from his illness over Christmas. His last wish to see his boat finished. So, as my dad would say, You'd better get your finger out, lad. When she was first built in 1960, RT sported a cantilevered hardtop canopy with canvas sides and a split windscreen. All the photographs I had from this period showed RT with a canopy down. So it was difficult to see how this originally looked. That was until Mr. Philip Haywood sent me some amazing colour photographs of his family holiday on board Royal Tudor in 1965. Mr. Haywood also described how hard it was to put the canopy up and down, especially with the wind blowing. 
In 1970, Royal Tudor underwent a major refit, which included a cockpit and canopy. Gone was the awkward-to-handle hardtop, to be replaced by a soft-top canopy supported by curved oak beams, a new fold-down cockpit sides and a tri-split windscreen. This is still the configuration Royal Tudor has today. Now this brings me to a question of conservation versus restoration. Do I return RT back to her drafty 1960s configuration? Do I restore the 1970s cockpit? Or do I build new? I suppose it's a bit like RT's antiquated toilet. What are the chances of getting my missus to use the old dump through? Not a cat in hell's chance. Looking at the old cockpit sides, waters penetrated the joints and the timber started to rot. So as the cockpit sides are a later addition and the timber has deteriorated, I'm going to make new instead of restoring the old. So let's get on with stripping everything down, starting with the broken glass, so I can take some measurements and start ordering some lumber. Safety first, particularly with an idiot like me, so it's on with the gloves and the coggles. The original glass was held in place by quarter inch hardwood beading, which in turn was held down with mastic and pins. The old mastic is a buggeration to shift, so I'm going to use a chisel and mallet to prise off the beading. With the beading removed, I can safely pull out the remains of the glass and dispose of it. I can now start carefully removing the fixings and fittings from the frames. Leftover pins from the window beading are removed. I need some pincers. Canopy lacing hooks. There are roughly 20 of these bloody things all around the cockpit. At some point, a few of the stainless hooks have been replaced with nylon. Now this could be due to difficulties in finding matching replacements. The closest I've found in stainless are from Sheridan Marine on their website at sheridanmarine.com. But it's more likely the cost. Well, I think so, but then I'm Yorkshire. 20 at £2.60 is 52 quid on lacing hooks, just for the centre cockpit canopy alone. BOAT is an acronym for bung on another thousand, you know. Four butterfly hinges are removed. Well, that's five quid each. Now I think I will replace these with something a little more robust when it comes time to hang the cockpit sides. There are also two short cabin latches and two long cabin latches as well. All in all, about a hundred quid's worth of hardware. All safe for later use or use as spares. Now to start taking apart the frame with the most damage. The frames were originally constructed using half lap joints on the corners and pinned mortise and tenon joints where the jaw meets the beam. Although lasting over 40 years, the half lap joints are the joints that have failed. As the wood has shrunk with age, weather and want of varnish, water has penetrated into the joint rotting the wood. A closer look at the joint and we see some evidence that the glue or mastic used to fix the joint was only present on the outer edges. The fixings used in the construction of classic boats like Royal Tudor were brass and they are an absolute pain in the backside to extract. The heads will be coated over with 50 years of varnish and the metal is soft so the heads break off easily. Brass screws also corrode quickly. The reaction between metal, timber and water leaving black stains where the fixing penetrates the wood. But I'm sure we'll cover that later. As I'm not restoring the frame but using it for patterns, I'm not going to muck about carefully extracting the screws. I'll just knock them through and whip them out with a claw hammer. To separate the lintel that supported the canopy beams, I work my way along it with a cold steel in the process knackering my lawn. The pin tenon joint turns out to be the strongest. I have to resort to knocking out the jaw with a mallet. Here you can see the pin or the dowel that was driven in to hold it in place. With all of the hardware removed, 
and all pieces of the original frames dismantled, laid out and accounted for, it's time to take some accurate measurements and order some lumber. I took careful measurements of both cockpit sides. Norfolk boat builders are renowned for designing boats on the back of folk packets, and Royal Tudor is certainly no exception. I think I'm going to make the new cockpit sides slightly larger than the old ones to allow them to be planed to an exact fit when I fix them to the cabin. There are some complicated angles along the edges of the cockpit frames. The bottom edge has a reverse French cleat where it joins the batten on the cabin. The front edges are also angled, as are the top edges to prevent wear on the canvas canopy. Royal Tudor was originally constructed from Honduran mahogany on oak. Honduran mahogany, or proper mahogany if you will, is well, it's just bloody expensive and difficult to come by. Over her 57 years, RT has had several different species of wood used in repairs. Sapele, Utele and African mahogany have all been used at some point. Although cost is a factor in the restoration, I made the decision that only hardwood will be used. Where we can, we reuse good timber removed from one area of RT in the restoration of another. We try to match as best we can RT's original colour and grain, but in the end we're going to have to stain the wood that's going to be varnished, just so that everything matches. So bearing this in mind, I choose several planks of inch thick by five and a half inch wide sapele. I selected planks with the least amount of figuring, and of course a colour to match Royal Tudor's existing timber. Finally, it's time to make some sawdust. The first rule of cutting timber with only one hand that works right is you never talk about cutting timber with only one hand that works right, right? No. Cobblers. The thing about woodwork when you're disabled is that you need to do a lot more planning. It's not just cut this, plane that and measure the other. You also have to think about what your body is going to be doing, or not as the case may be. For example, if I push a plank through the table saw, will I be able to support the weight? Will I drop it? Will I lose balance and fall over? Hopefully not onto the saw blade. Above all, you're thinking, can I control the machine and the material safely? So first I cut the lumber a few inches over length using the sliding miter saw. It's much easier to handle and rip shorter planks than long ones. Now we're going to get more precise as I rip the lumber to width on the table saw. Finally I cross cut, still slightly over length and again on the table saw. Being slightly over length will give me a bit of wiggle room when it comes to cutting the half lap joints later. Well that's a theory anyway. So now it's time to label everything to avoid confusion. I'm assisted in this by Dylan the boat's beagle. I hope that bit is just buried wasn't important. I bet it is. With all of the sections of Royal Tudor's cabin sides cut, I'll be moving on to my attempts at joinery in the next episode, as well as making a trip down to Norfolk to work on the old girl herself. If you've enjoyed watching the boat's log, please like, please comment and subscribe to this channel. Visit our website at theroyaltudor.co.uk or stop by and say hello at the NorfolkBroadsNetwork.com. Details are in the description below. If you see us out and about on the broads, give us a wave. Otherwise, I'll see you next time on the boat's log.